Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for all our attendees. Thanks for joining us today. We'll go ahead and get started in a few minutes. But before we do that, let's uh, get some get some shout outs going with where folks are joining us from. Uh, I'm joining from the San Francisco Bay Area. Shelly, where, where, yeah, your beautiful I'm, background, where are you? I'm in chilly Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Wonderful. And, and Luca? Leo, I'm not too far from you. I'm also joining from San Francisco. Phenomenal. I feel like someone forgot to fly me out. That's... <laughs> we'll, we'll do it next time. Great. Yeah, we've got a lot of fun places. Park City from the UK, from Birmingham, Oakland, California, Denver, Colorado. That's amazing. Well, keep it going. We love to hear uh, where our audience is joining us from. And, you know, a very diverse group uh, for today's for today's webinar um, on how to measure the ROI of a CLM. So uh, my name is Leo Rodriguez. I'm on the product marketing team here at Ironclad, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, I'm joined by two phenomenal panelists, Shelly Platt from InTouch CX and Luca San from Forrester Research. Uh, before we get started, I'll share a little bit about my background. Um, I have over 15 years experience. I started my career at Intuit um, in their M&A group, uh, working a lot on acquisitions and divestitures. Um, and I later uh, moved on to PwC where I did M&A consulting. Um, and dealt a lot with contracts, um, a lot with uh, PDFs, a lot with Word docs, a lot with email, um, and was really excited to bring my expertise here uh, at Ironclad, where I've spent over two and a half years um, working on the product marketing team and working with phenomenal um, guests like uh, Shelly and Luca. Um, so uh, before uh, we get into the meat of it, um, Shelly, why don't you give uh, folks in the audience a little bit about your background and what in touch CX uh, does. Awesome. Thanks, Leo. Uh, as you said, Shelly Plett from InTouch CX. I am the VP of Con or VP Contract Strategy here uh, for InTouch CX. Those that don't know, we are a global leader in customer experience management, digital engagement, and AI and automation solutions. Uh, we work with brands around the globe to provide great customer experience. Uh, basically backend services, business process outsourcing on behalf of those brands. We've been around for 20 plus years and have really grown with our clients uh, through our long-term trusted partnerships and relationships. I've been with InTouch for about 10 years uh, and my role here has really evolved from a sales and marketing support role into leading our contract strategy, particularly for client facing contracts. Uh, and I'm really excited to be part of driving innovative solutions for our clients and internally. So Ironclad being one of them, I'm excited to have this conversation today. Phenomenal. Thanks for joining. And Luca, over to you. Thanks, Leo. My name is Luca. I'm here at Forrester's Total Economic Impact Practice here in our San Francisco office. I've been with Forrester for over four years now, helping our clients justify technology investments. And we do so by going beyond your typical TCO or even ROI analysis in what we call a total economic impact case study. And so today I'll be walking you through some research that we did on that impact with Ironclad. Great. Um, and, you know, uh, we like to keep things interactive. Um, we know that, you know, we're talking about ROI, we're talking about contracts, um, but it's going to be fun. And so in order to keep things interactive, uh, we want to hear from the audience, um, from you, what are you most excited to learn about in today's webinar? Um, we have a lot of exciting topics. We have some real world examples that Shelly's going to bring to life. We have some uh, results from a TEI study that Luca led. Um, but really there's a couple of key things that we wanted to gauge from the audience. Uh, you know, do you want to learn about how to build, build a business case for CLM? Something that we hear a lot about from our customers and from our prospects is how do I actually make, uh, the justification for a, a CLM? Um, the next, you know, is all around KPIs. Uh, once I've implemented a CLM or even just thinking about a CLM, what are the KPIs or, you know, the key performance indicators that I should be looking at from a business standpoint? And so I can measure my before and my after, um, and even just during, you know, the process so how do I know that I'm actually utilizing this tool correctly? 
Um, what are the benefits that I can measure using Ironclad? Um, and then, you know, third is like, what are some of the unquantifiable benefits? Uh, is it time back? Is it that I can, you know, go home, spend time with my kids, take some PTO without worrying about contracts, making the sales team happy just because they're not breathing down my neck? Um, you know, like really some of those unquantifiable benefits. And um, it looks like, you know, the majority is all of the above, uh, you know, and, and that's great because we're going to cover um, all of those topics and, you know, we'll touch on KPIs uh, as, as, a, as a salient point throughout uh, the presentation today. Um, it seems like that's uh, top of mind for many of you. Um, so uh, let's get into it. Um, Luca, you spent a lot of time with Forrester clients, helping them think through the business value how to measure ROI of a contract lifecycle management solution. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Forrester's methodology around assessing the total economic impact of a CLM? Absolutely. Let's jump into it. And before we jump into it, a quick disclaimer that I want to bring up to the forefront of this conversation. Uh, this is a commission study and Forrester Consulting is an independent practice. I'm not here to say that I endorse Ironclad, but rather to say that based off of the data and analysis that we conducted, this is the total economic impact that we saw. Okay, so let's set the foundation here I'm going to spend a couple minutes just talking you through what a TEI is so we know what we're talking about as we go through this conversation. Um, the TEI or total economic impact is a proven methodology that Forrester has been using to help our clients justify technology investments for over 20 years. The key four pillars that underpin all of these studies are benefits, costs, flexibility, and risks. The benefits ultimately boil down to money made or money saved. Uh, we measure costs, but not just licensing or subscription costs, but change management, implementation, training, and any other factors that go into realizing benefits. In the flexibility section, we capture the future possibilities that are enabled by making an investment decision today. And then finally, we account for everything or we look through a lens of risk. What are the barriers to realizing a, an investment's full potential and how can we address those? A vital element to this methodology is that we speak to existing customers who have experienced a measurable impact from their investment in Ironclad. We use the data that we gather from those conversations as the basis for our findings. And ultimately, we want you to be able to take the results that you hear today and be, begin considering how you can build a business case for your organization. So let's start with the high level results first. All in all, we found a return on investment of 314%, uh, with total benefits of $4.86 million. And then when you subtract the costs that it takes to get those benefits, we arrive to an NPV or net present value of $3.68 million. I know we're not all finance people. The net present value you can think simply as just the net value, the total value that you receive uh, from investing in Ironclad. And I'll get us jump started here with a quote from the head of legal operations that said, I felt like ironclad had advanced to the point where it was really exceeding the market in certain areas like ease of use, user interface, and the ease of implementation. So let's talk about how we got to this point. First, we interviewed interviewees within five predominantly enterprise organizations using ironclad across travel e-commerce real estate technology and customer service industries these customers had experience using ironclad on both the buy side as well as the sell side and click wrap for click wrap agreements like ndas And, and Luca, can you maybe just uh, help the audience sort of grok the type of use cases specifically on the buy side and the sell side um, that some of these uh, customers uh, were using Ironclad for? Yeah. Uh, 
On the buy side, there were procurement use cases, There's one for our technology organization sourcing materials for their solutions. Um, that was an interesting use case. And on the sell side, uh, we had contracts flowing to customers, to partners, and establishing agreements between those two parties. And ClickRep, we will dive into more detail in the quantified benefits. So I'll leave that as a surprise. <laughs> Love surprises. Um, okay, cool. So uh, thank you so much, Luca, for setting the stage and sort of giving the audience a feel for the type of customers that that you interviewed and, you know, sort of who actually, you know, Ironclad can be suitable for, you know, as you can see, ranges everyone from travel to real estate to technology to customer service. Um, we love serving all types of customers um, from the enterprise all the way to the mid market. Um, I think what is also really uh, interesting to learn is, you know, what are the contracting pain points that some of our um, customers and prospects are faced with? So uh, we have another poll question just um, to also get a little bit more data from you all and hear some of the challenges that you all are, are faced with um, in today's, uh, in, in your day to day. Um, so, you know, as you can see, I don't know if you can see the poll questions that are, um, in the voting uh, section of uh, your uh, of, of the webinar, um, but there's a couple different options. You know, one is like slow turnaround times. Um, is you know, what are the friction points that are inhibiting you from realizing the maximum benefit of the turnaround that you can be achieving with with your contracts? Uh, is it that there's you know a lack of a centralized repository and that you know contracts are scattered all over the place? or maybe have multiple repositories that you're having to go through just to find um, the contract that you're looking for. Um, you know, or is it more of like just a standardized playbooks? Maybe you're a little bit more advanced in your journey and you know, you're thinking about playbooks and you're thinking about how to standardize that across the sell side, across the buy side, across not just your legal team, but across those different departments. Um, so uh, those are the different options in the poll question. Um, and, you know, just, looking at some of the responses and thank you all uh audience participation is key to this webinar folks so please um you know let's uh keep it going but it looks like the most uh, you know it's very close it's tied between you know slow turnaround times or a centralized repository um both things that we hear uh, a lot uh, a lot about um so thank you for uh in engaging in in the poll Let's go on to the next slide where Luca, I believe you're going to share a little bit more about some of those challenges that you heard from our, uh, from the, from, from those that participated in the study. Of course, the key challenges or prior challenges are instrumental in understanding what your current processes are like and what's going to catalyze change in the future as we're all on this journey to optimize our processes. Uh, with our case study, we spoke to customers and first and foremost understood what they were doing before Ironclad. They shared that they had manual processes, Leo, like you mentioned, having multiple repositories. They were using in-house built tools or simply had a legacy CLM uh, that they were shifting away from. Um, the interviewees across these different prior states all shared some similar vein of these common challenges outlined here. Those include disjointed, time-consuming, and manual processes to manage their contracts. That was a huge one and took an operational toll across these organizations. Inefficient collaboration and communication led to delays in contract execution and non-compliant processes. There was a lack of visibility and control which increased the risk of non-compliance legal disputes and made it really difficult for legal teams to enforce guardrails. Customers missed opportunities for cost savings and revenue generation due to a lack of visibility into the terms of their contracts. Another issue was that there was a reliance on intuition rather than uh, institutional knowledge embedded within Ironclad. Then ultimately, all these pain points surmounted to stifled business velocity and an inability to grow contract management alongside business needs. I see Shelly violently agreeing with a lot of these challenges. 
And can I'd I put my to... hand up for all of them? I feel like you just quoted me. <laughs> well, I, I was actually going to, you know, sort of uh, would love your thoughts here, uh, Shelley, you know, in, in your time uh, at in touch CX, like, you know, do some of these resonate more than others? Um, maybe give a little bit of color uh, to the yeah. audience about what you've been challenged with. I think, uh, and we were, we'll get into the in touch CX growth story. And in particular, I think how contract strategies become a, a bit of a key part of our sales process in a, in a minute or two. But for us, this was very much it. We were homegrown. We figured out how to do this on our own in touch feels like we're a special organization. We don't do things in a very standardized way. And that meant that none of our processes really fit a normal, which meant we always built them special and they were always breaking. They were always held together with duct tape and wishes, which may or may not be the exact way I described it to, uh, to our ironclad sales rep when we first talked. Uh, but it really felt like we were holding something together that was frail and wasn't purpose built for contracting. It was sort of what it needed to be at the time, but it wasn't mature. And all of these pain points were symptoms of the same, I would say like root cause that we had figured it out, but we hadn't necessarily matured. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. And, um, you know, I think Luca's going to go into the next part, which is a good segue, uh, around the business case. Like, you know, now that, you know, you have these challenges, how do you actually go about sort of like building the business case? What is a, what is a good framework that the audience should, you know, maybe think about Luca in their, in their day-to-day, uh, in their day-to-day roles. So, um, would love to hear how, you know, you sort of like, uh, thought about it. Of course. So a little bit more groundwork here on this slide, uh, because we spoke to five interviewees, what we do is we create a composite organization based off of the data points and experiences of those interviewees. So you can think of this as just a blended organization of the customers that we spoke to. Our composite here is a $1.5 billion organization that serves B2B and B2C customers. It's global and their use case as it pertains to Ironclad is they use, uh, they are Ironclad users for both sales and procurement contracts, as well as Ironclad quick wrap. Their average order value for B2C customers is $300, which you'll see will we'll factor into our final quantified benefit. And then when we're, when we're thinking about the volume of contracts on both the sales and procurement uh, use cases, we the composite organization has 900 contracts in year one, and then scales that up 15% in year two and another 15% in year three. So that gives us a foundation of what uh, the characteristics are that underpin some of the dollar values you see. So within that 314% return on investment that I shared at the top of this conversation are four quantified benefit categories that I'll spend the next few minutes diving into more detail. Uh, within the study itself, uh, PDF, uh, we break down the calculations of each of these four benefits into financial tables that's transparent, easy to follow, and ready to be applied to your organization. So I hope you get your hands on a copy of the study and use the frameworks that we've developed to begin building your business case. But for now, I'll just hit on the highlights of those benefits. So our first two benefits, oh, before we move on to the next one, just to frame our conversation. Um, our first two benefits here are contracting efficiency and legal efficiency. Those articulate the operational savings. And then in our final two benefits, we get into the top line and bottom line impacts of revenue and profit generation uh, with uh, business growth from quick wrap. Okay. So when we think about quantified value, putting numbers to paper, the first benefit we captured is how Ironclad impacted the overall contracting process from contract drafting negotiating, amending, implementing, and renewing. By centralizing their CLM processes to Ironclad, customers reported expedited contract creation, review, and approvals, and gained insights really to contribute to the flywheel effect of optimizing their contract process. Um, as a result, customers increased their throughput and velocity while decreasing administration 
and ultimately fostering better collaboration. Our analysis with this benefit showed a 65% improvement in contracting efficiency, which means saving valuable labor hours across each stage of the contract lifecycle and across multiple personas. When we tally up this impact, this leads to a $1.2 million, uh, $1 million of labor savings over three years. The next category of quantified benefit impact revolves around legal and legal operations who are responsible for contract management. With Ironclad, customers reported greater compliance, collaboration, and efficiency. This means that organizations, again, save valuable legal resources and time to reinvest into other activities. One customer told us that an outcome of those productivity gains led to the reduced need for outside legal counsel, which we know can be very expensive. Beyond the productivity cost savings, organizations felt that they could scale to meet growing contract management needs without adding more operational toll and increasing headcount, uh, reflected through some of the quotes that are sprinkled through here. Overall, our analysis found that legal resources save 60% of their time managing contracts with Ironclad compared to their legacy uh, systems and environment. Combining that with reduced outside legal counsel costs, there's a $1.2 million cost savings on the legal front over three years. All right. In our third quantified benefit, we shift away from those operational cost savings of investing in Ironclad and look at the top line revenue and then profit impact. In other words, the impact of leveraging Ironclad strategically and as a revenue engine, so to speak. With Ironclad supporting their sell side contracts, customers told us that contracting efficiencies enabled by Ironclad helped accelerate their sales cycles and revenue recognition. Additionally, the added visibility in and control of contracting terms helped organizations identify and negotiate favorable terms and helped them avoid lost revenue opportunities. Our analysis found a 0.25% increase in profit margin, which may seem like an insignificant figure, but results in a $1.1 million incremental profit impact over three years. And then finally here, our fourth and final quantified benefit unpacks the business growth from ClickWrap contracts. Customers who used Ironclad ClickWrap for use cases such as customer and partner signups with terms of service agreements, as one example, shared that Ironclad was instrumental in reshaping their customer experience, reducing customer journey friction, and ultimately improving customer conversion rates. We found that with ClickWrap, there was a three percentage point increase in customer conversion rate and increased business opportunities that led to a $1.3 million impact of incremental profit over three years. And then, sorry, uh, Luca, thank you for walking us through the, the benefits and sort of what, you know, your, your, your research found, um, maybe just to bring it home and to, you know, level set a little bit for the audience, uh, you know, how do they, you know, maybe just categorize the different buckets, um, you know, that you found in your, uh, research that came up more frequent than, than not, and sort of like, thinking about, well, where do I even start? Like, you know, do I start with click wrap? Do I start with profitability? Do I start with sales? Like, you know, what's a good starting point just given um, sort of the breadth of, the, of, of different options available uh, from a business case standpoint? That's a good question. Uh, I just threw a lot of different numbers and categories at you. So I'm going to take a step back and talk more at a high level. Uh, my first recommendation when taking these high level results, you're probably asking yourself, well, how the heck do I start building this case uh, for my organization? 
I recommend developing a vision first and foremost, and do so by identifying and articulating those main pain points that you have in your current contracting processes, like we spoke about. What are you struggling with most? Is it a lack of proper version control, streamlined approval processes, uh, no automation, or are you just simply leaving money on the table when contracts are due for renewal, but your organization lacks visibility into contracting terms? Uh, contract terms, rather. Next, develop those KPIs. Uh, there's KPIs are listed out within the study in more detail, but ultimately this is unique to your organization. The starting point for a lot of the customers that we interviewed was to measure simply the time that's spent on manual processes. Um, if you can figure out a good way to attach the actual time spent by each person across your organization on contract processes that can be automated, that already puts a strong foundation in the productivity benefits. Then once you have that, I encourage you to start thinking more thematically and strategically about how a solution like Ironclad could help your organization improve that biz uh, business agility, like with the shortening of sales cycles, improve customer and partner experiences, which leads to further opportunities in the future, um, and ultimately unlocking new business opportunities. So once you've articulated your challenges, defined your vision, measured your KPIs, socialize that with a greater team with your stakeholders to generate buy-in and really show what the future impact can look like. Great. Thank thank you Luca and you know um I, I don't want to say easier said than done but you know it 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 does seem like even just starting uh at, at at one point you know whether that's categorizing the hours or whether that's categorizing you know the time spent um in in a spreadsheet or you know in in in, in stakeholder interviews i think that it, that can be a good starting point um and and with shelly like you're a veteran when it comes to contracts and you've seen a lot in your time at in touch cx tell us about how you identified contracts as a key initiative like what got you motivated what got you jazzed um I, I'd love for you to share uh, a little bit more with, with the audience. Yeah, absolutely. I think to go back to where contracts really became a pivotal storytelling point for us, uh, it's important to understand just our growth journey. And a big part of being nimble and particularly behaving like a startup is that everybody does a little bit of everything. And I'm sure I'm not the only organization where our salespeople were primarily negotiating contracts. In many cases, they were drafting contracts, they were agreeing to contract term changes, uh, and we're very empowered to do that. And, and that's a good thing. And for a lot of companies, that's how they grow really fast. But that leads to a lot of differentiation, not standardization. Uh, and as our organization grew and developed, there was a real need to start putting things in a repeatable manner. And in particular, looking at things like term and termination clauses, our annual cost of living adjustment language, anything that really could be repeatable across contracts, we wanted that continuity. And we also needed better control for stakeholder management, right? We had, you know, very independent salespeople who were following their own version of a process and getting approvals, you know, off the side of a desk rather than following a true funnel to have layers of approval along the way. And all of those things led to the formation of a contract strategy team that became focused on looking at the paperwork and took not the power and the empowerment away from the sales team, but we took the administrative side of it away and said, let me worry about the stuff that isn't fun, isn't the sprinkles, isn't going to differentiate the sale. Let me worry about it. And my team will then create the standardization and process that the organization needs. And we're actually going to free you up to go do what you do well, which is build relationships and, and bring in new clients. So the pivot point became sort of volume based and then mature, like maturation uh, in terms of creating standardization uh, without stifling the nature of, you know, what our sales team does best. Yeah, I <clears throat> think that falls like squarely in value bucket number one that Luca sort of like articulated around the streamlining of the end to end contracting process. like giving them the time to go, you know, focus on either revenue generating activities or non-administrative tasks um, is really, you know, a key value that uh, you're describing and something that I'm, I'm 
glad that you identified early as an opportunity to really shift the team's focus time using a, using a CLM. Yeah. Um, and, you know, once you identified, you know, those, those, I guess, symptoms, uh, if you will, in your process, like, how did you go about building the business case? Um, you know, you mentioned working with a lot of different stakeholders, um, different department heads, maybe even different frontline reps, or even, um, you know, suppliers, if you will. But, you know, how did you think about sort of like that business case um, in actual application to your role in, in touch? It was uh, the best of times and the worst of times, right? When you get tasked with solving a problem and you start unpacking uh, the, the things other people have to say about the problem, you're, you're given a great opportunity to take the good and the bad and the ugly all together. And we had lots of feedback in terms of friction points, right? Sales felt like legal didn't understand the nature of a sales game. So legal was slowing things down and they were putting barriers in place so the sales team couldn't go and close deals. And there were friction points with internal experts, SMEs getting reviews uh, and approvals and things weren't moving quickly or we weren't getting the right answers. And it became very apparent that no one was speaking the same language. We didn't have those simplified standards in place. It was very much ad hoc. And through those like stakeholder interviews internally and through living it, right, starting to take over the administrative side of contracts, we started putting a clearer box around pain points and saying the communication flow with our legal team, with our subject matter experts, that's not efficient. We're going to create a very repeatable process so they understand what to get uh, or what they're getting in terms of paperwork and what the expectation is to return. And then we created standardization in terms of language templates and playbooks, right? What is the appropriate language to put forward and what's allowed and not allowed in terms of uh, contract negotiation? Those things gave us measurable pain points. We could start saying that when we send it over to this subject matter expert, here's how many days it sits with them before we get something back. And we created those SLAs. Right. When we talk about the KPIs, building that use case, we were able to say, I hand a document to legal and I don't get it back for seven business days. Right. If I have a hot sales cycle, seven business days is too long. And if the legal team needs seven days, then the compliance team needs two days and the IT team, InfoSec, needs two days. I've got way too many days here. Uh, so we start putting those KPIs in place and saying, what is a reasonable turnaround time? And then how do I empower those teams to move more quickly? Because you can't just walk into someone's office and tell them they have to move faster. Uh, go try it, see how it goes. But we worked on empowering them with better tools and better expectations so that when we said, you know, three to five business days for that turnaround for all of those resources, here's how we're going to get it done. We were able to see a measurable difference when we implemented Ironclad because of the facilitation that it offered to our team. I love that. Um, curious, Luca, in you know your conversations, how far along were you know the, the the individuals that you spoke with along, like actually having that sort of business case already flushed out? Uh, you know, was that something that they had done prior to starting the CLM evaluation, or was that something that they did, you know, post? That's a great question, and. I think this is a common story that I hear from time and time again is, well, they had an inclination, they had some pain points, they had some catalysts that ultimately got them uh, their foot in the door with ironclad. But as they start realizing the value, as they start iterating on their processes and figuring out, well, now we've eliminated these administrative tasks, what else can we do with this platform? that's when those real savings start to manifest in their minds. And when we spoke to those customers, they had a clear idea of what that value has been since their investment. Um, and as we do speak to customers who have at least six months, usually upwards of a few years of experience, anywhere between six months to two years. So they have that experience. They've had time to really get up to steady state and realize their benefits. And I think there's there's layers to this journey. Um, and I think with every business process, as it matures, you look at it differently, right? The flower unfolds and you see different colors. 
And there's a lot of really key benefits to moving from an unstandardized process to a standardized process, whether that's with Ironclad uh, or another CLM, the benefits in the process are immediate because it's so obvious, so measurable and so apparent, but those non-measurable benefits just continue to show up and you see them naturally over time. Some of them you can't really measure, but you can feel the impact on the way that the team is able to accomplish work. Uh, and even just the interplay in terms of being able to walk into a meeting room and knowing that, you know, we've managed to avoid certain types of risk or we've benefited by ensuring we've got this level of standardization and you can create new business process on top of the things that you've already gained. It's been really cool to see. Love that. And yeah, we're going to get into the unquantifiable benefits in just a minute. Um, but let's spend a few minutes talking about impact. Like, how have you been able to measure it? How have you been able to demonstrate um, the value that Ironclad has delivered, uh, Shelly, in your role? Um, I know you've started exploring additional use cases uh, on the buy side and also NDAs, um, you know, but even how you've measured impact uh, to date, but then also thinking about those uh, impact across those new use cases and those other initiatives. Yeah, we, we started Ironclad on the sale side. Uh, so for our client facing contracts, and that's really been my cup of tea here for the last three or four years. But as we've seen our stakeholders buy into the benefits of Ironclad, it's become apparent that there's opportunities in other departments. And the real on the cusp one is within our procurement team. So where we are purchasing activities to be able to uh, align the playbook type concepts that are in Ironclad, the approver and stakeholder management, and then the repository management for those procurement contracts uh, is next up on the list of things to tackle. So it's naturally gaining steam and momentum. Uh, we're also looking at ClickGraph now for Q1 to just continue to automate things like NDAs, uh, where we were taking a much more bespoke approach and looking at every NDA on its own, we've decided that we can simplify that, we can automate that. Uh, and so we're excited to buy into some of the additional features that Ironclad offers to continue that momentum. But when we started the justification, we were very junior. And now I look at it in terms of uh, how quickly my new hires can be equivalent uh, to some of my more tenured folks on my team. And I know some of them are watching. I'm very proud of you. Uh, the, the fact that we can get a new hire up and running and give them confidence to redline a statement of work, to redline an MSA within a couple of months would have been impossible a year or two ago. And it's because we have things like playbooks. We have things like the approval flows that flag, uh, you know, this insurance clause is outside of our requirements. Send this one to the compliance team. We are creating structure that empowers people to move faster while achieving the same business goals. And that to me is just continuing to grow day over day as we are putting in more time and effort into you know, building our playbook, leaning into the AI features of Ironclad uh, and expanding the, the breadth of our team without adding FTE, which is the other half of the conversation We've managed to double our output, but we haven't doubled our team size. And so that type of dynamic that allows us to be more efficient with the resources that we have and to delay hiring in some cases to add additional resources, again, it compounds that financial benefit. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, uh, I think 2023 has been called the year of efficiency. And, you know, I'm sure, Luca, a lot of the folks that you speak to uh, efficiencies high on their uh, sort of objectives and OKRs. But, you know, I'm thinking back to the poll question where, you know, folks uh, in the audience were really eager to learn about, you know, sort of the KPIs and sort of how they can actually leverage, you know, both process data and metadata from Ironclad to really start tracking and measuring uh, some of those KPIs that may be, you know, uh, unique to their business or specific to their department. Um, you mentioned some of the different areas or some of the capabilities that you all have used, um, you know, whether it be playbooks, whether it be AI, whether it be some of the approvals, but thinking about like how you're actually surfacing, you know, those uh, results. Um, can you speak a little bit more about in, pract in practice, how that goes about from, you know, being in the product day to day, or even just having your reps, you know, actually leveraging the tool 
um, to actually, you know, surfacing some of those KPIs in a, you know, management presentation or to your E-team or to your VPs? Yeah. Uh, the one that we look at, uh, well, I'll do it in, in the layer. So the first one that I look at is turnaround time internally, right? Days between when we received it, we marked it with InTouch CX in terms of the pen. And then how many days did it take us to return it to the client? Right. So it's how fast did we get that tennis ball back over the fence so that the other party can be taking a look at it. And for us on the sales side, speed to turn paperwork is completely related to how quickly we can get a client up and running and live, which is, again, great for those revenue projections. So that is our first and foremost, because it's the most controllable factor. Um, And that's where, again, the entire team contributes to that SLA. It's not just those on my team that are really pushing the envelope and kind of managing the process. It's also all the stakeholders internally that are involved. So turnaround time is the first one. Number of turns is the second one, right? So how many times do we have to go back to the client to renegotiate another item, uh, which I think is more related to uh, how well do we understand our contracts and are we putting together like great responses that make a lot of sense? Uh, But that again, goes back to playbook and do you have a great playbook? So that's the second one. And then the third one would be full time to close, right? So when when did we start this contracting project and when did we complete it and actually sign it? That again is a reflection of how quickly we're moving internally, how well we're facilitating the actual turnaround cycles uh, in order to get a a contract closed and signed. And those three data points we look at uh, on a weekly basis, for sure, we're tracking our projects to keep them moving. But then quarterly, we're looking at our performance as a team and trying to diagnose areas of opportunity. And I know Ironclad in particular lets us look at users and whether users are taking longer than their allotted time. And we can understand then why, right? Why do we need actually a few more days because this particular process has changed? Or can we push it and say, we need to move faster on this particular item because our turnaround time is struggling? So we use those very particular KPIs to keep that engine rolling on a, on a quick basis. Thank you for that. Um, you, we've heard about some of the unquantifiable benefits uh, throughout um, the, the presentation so far, but I wanted to maybe just hand it over back over to Luca so that he can give us a little bit more uh, you know, of a higher level view of what are those unquantifiable benefits that you, know, you heard from uh, the folks that you spoke with uh, during the TEI process. Of course. And these unquantified benefits or qualitative benefits were numerous. Um, and to interviewees could be just as important or maybe even more important than the quali- uh, quantitative benefits rather. Um, and starting with our first three, we heard customers saving technology costs or uh, costs that they no longer are paying to sunset legacy solutions. We heard that implementation with Ironclad was faster, cheaper, and had more support compared to the prior experiences, which, yes, can be quantifiable, but also has a strong uh, business risk reduction component to it. Um, the next is customers reported reduced policy violations and errors. Um, by standardizing and increasing compliance guardrails. So, Shelly, I see you nodding your head. Which one of these uh, or how many of these resonate with you? Are there any ones that stand out? Uh, for me, the third one was a big, a, a big item. I know for anybody that's been part of like facilitating signatures in DocuSign, and I think I saw it on one of your other slides, like voided contract signing flows were like, our version of accidents in the workplace, right? How many days since we got a DocuSign contract voided? And since we launched Ironclad, I can think of one, right? Where we used to have one a month or two a month where we had, you know, something got approved, but it didn't get properly approved. And we then had a stakeholder say, no, that's not going for signature, go fix it. Uh, So for me, that third one is just icing on the cake that we're able to do things at a level of excellence that we weren't doing before. All right. Our next set of qualitative benefits here, uh, ease of use was a strong theme throughout here. And that feeds into a number of things, greater adoption amongst users, employee experience. Shelly, perhaps even uh, you mentioned ramping up new employees quicker. Perhaps this plays into that as well. Uh, We heard that there were deeper insights and analytics and reporting through Ironclad. 
than with prior environments. And then lastly, increase sales velocity and improve customer experience and supplier relationships. Shelly, which one do you want to take a bite out of here? I mean, I've already hit that third one pretty hard in terms of speed to turn documents, uh, but it it's sort of indicative that the whole process is working as it should, right? It's healthy and it's flowing properly. Uh, but I think I'd agree ease of use has also been a really big benefit. I don't know if, again, I've, we've got lots of people here that have been through version control nightmares where you've got tangled turns of documents that weren't named accordingly and now you're redlining on old red lines. Like that, that doesn't happen anymore when you've got a great tool in place. Uh, so you, you look smarter, you are smarter, you move faster because you've got a tool that makes it easy to be excellent. Uh, and I think that that is uh, another real sign of maturing your process. So those types of things, I, I can't put a quantifiable number to, but I sure appreciate that it exists. Yeah. And um, if I were to just add, I think all three of these um, are, are uh, you know, manifestations of uh, f- the feedback that we hear um, both from our customers, our business users, our admins, um, and really a lot uh, of folks in the audience here, like, you know, please provide feedback on some of these unquantifiable benefits because, you know, part of um, what we'd love to hear is like where we're doing well, what we could be doing better. Um, and, you know, ultimately how this goes about delivering uh, value to you, to your stakeholders, um, and, you know, just improving the, the contracting process that you have today. Um, and so, you know, part of the unquantifiable benefits are also thinking through, well, you know, what can be tracked that's maybe quantifiable. So, Luca, I would love to hear a little bit about how you actually, you know, sort of spoke to, you know, the unquantifiable to the quantifiable and how you identified those um, in your study. Yeah, certainly. I can speak to how we distinguish those unquantified and qualitative benefits. Uh, We think the business value goes beyond just the quantified, qualitative, and ROI story. It really is the overall narrative. It really is how is your team going to be impacted from a time-saving perspective, but also from an efficacy perspective, an emotional perspective. And that's where we supplement or add on these qualitative benefits to make it more than just numbers. How is this going to impact your overall contracting experience? And how is this going to enable greater business opportunities and agility when it all comes down to that? Great. Um, well, thank you for, for uh, Shelly and for Luca um, for this interactive conversation. Let's also uh, take some questions from the audience. Um, it's been a little quiet, but we also have some really uh, uh, interesting questions here. So the first um, is, you know, based on the discussion, looking at forward looking elements, what about getting your arms around your legacy contracts, understanding where standard terms have been included, uh, and how AI and risk assessments uh, on those, and then how will AI capabilities support this effort? Um, Maybe, Shelly, you can kind of take a crack at the legacy contracts. Um, and then understanding the, the terms and sort of like where those stand once you start getting your hands around that corpus yeah, so of legacy documents. When we moved into Ironclad, we had about a thousand documents that we wanted to bring in, right? Current client contracts uh, that had been signed prior to the Ironclad experience, but that we wanted to keep relevant and we wanted to treat them like the new paperwork. And a big part of it was understanding what are the key terms that matter Uh, And how are we going to even standardize the way we look at them? Because our contracts weren't the same template. So what was called payment terms in one would be called invoicing in the other and trying to align those things so that when we did the contract intake into Ironclad, we built a book of business with key terms that were all the same. Uh, And then the intake process to load a a legacy contract into Ironclad snapped to the new normal. And there's OCR features and functionalities that can automatically read a lot of the key terms. Uh, And I think AI is getting better and better at trying to find some of those custom terms and to fill them into the macro categories too. So there is a way to bring all of the legacy to come and live alongside the new normal, 
so that you can do that risk assessment. You can run a report of what's in your repository that does or does not contain a term. And then you can spit out a, an actual spreadsheet that allows you to do the analysis of which ones then are a priority for fixing. So it's it's possible, it's work, right? It's, it's all going to be work to make sure that everything uh, evolves and, and fits the future state of your contract experience, but it's the work that's worth doing. Yeah, and, and well worth the effort, I think, once you get all the contracts in and you sort of have your risk levels and sort of all the nice categories, you then have uh, a greater handle of, you know, wh what needs your attention and what can be sort of focused on later later stage. Um, and if I, another, oh, I'll just, one little word of caution here is pick your battles. Uh, we wanted to track, you know, 75 to 100 key data fields and it became overwhelming. Uh, so pick the big wins when you move into any CLM tool, if you're doing that activity, and then layer on some additional learnings as you go. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be distracted by the stuff that doesn't really matter and you, you, you may get hung up on it. So pick your battles, have a consolidated list of key terms that you're looking for. I love that. Pick the battles, make sure that you're focused on the right things. Um, here's an interesting one. Uh, you know, do you quantify the benefits of new people? learning faster, moving up the value train, maybe attrition goes down, you know, you have greater um, retention rates. And, you know, as a result, maybe keeps the work more interesting. It helps, you know, uh, institutional knowledge around KPIs. Um, you know, I, I think, yeah, Shelly, you'd be best to answer that one. But um, that's yeah, an interesting I, question. I have struggled to quantify it. Uh, so Brian, I'd, I'd love to understand a bit more about your team because we're a really tiny team. The impact of attrition uh, is sort of disproportionate. And so I don't measure it in numeric value, but what I do look at is employee development. And in particular, when we do things like annual performance reviews, or I, I always look at the job descriptions on my team every year, I'm always really proud to say that the job description has changed for my team because they're no longer doing a lot of the activities that I hired them to do in the first place because we've automated and gotten rid of them. So the things that were sort of paper pushing before go away and every member of my team can level up and do more because Ironclad's doing the rest of it. Love it. Um, well, thanks so much for those valuable insights and takeaways, Luca and Shelley. Luca, I'm going to end with one question towards you, um, which is, you know, everyone uh, at the end of this webinar is going to be receiving um, a, a copy of the Forrester uh, Total Economic Impact Report. Um, but like, wh what should people do? Like, you know, should they read it all in one go? How is it best consumed? Um, you know, what is your recommendation there? I will give a FOIA warning. It is a long report, a uh, long study. There's multiple pages in there with a lot of meat. You might not want to jump into all of it all at once. Hopefully from this conversation, you really have an idea of what are the key challenges? What are the benefits? What are the areas of interest that are relevant to your organization? And then just jump into there, learn a little bit more. Uh, we provide more supporting evidence and details, calculations on how you can think and conceptualize about uh, your organization and business value. So get your hands on the study, uh, dive into relevant sections for you and pull out some of those data points that you can use uh, when you're talking to your own stakeholders. Great. And, and are you taking calls? Like, can people, you know, contact you to like, you know, help them think through these challenges or um, should they go through other uh, resources? I would suggest starting with your team first, but I am available on LinkedIn if you want to connect. And uh, if you do have any questions, I will be available. Great. And Shelly, if, um, you know, members of the audience wanted to, you know, sort of pick your brains a little bit and, you know, thinking of like, where's, how to, where to start, like actually how to put these KPIs, um, how can they best reach, uh, reach you? Yeah, absolutely. LinkedIn is great. Uh, Shelly Plett, there's not very many of us out there. Uh, so connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat. I love to consult and to help others on their growth journey. So uh, get in touch. Thank you both. Um, and, you know, uh, since I have a, a captive audience, um, we will be hosting another webinar on November 29th. The topic is going to be a little different than this one. It's going to be more about uh, legal leaders at New York Times, Pfizer, Airbnb, and how they're driving digital transformation um, at their uh, organizations. 
Um, so November 29th, uh, you should also uh, see a registration in the chat. Um, save your spot and, you know, uh, we'll see you uh, hopefully in a few weeks. And if not, have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. And thank you so much, Luca and Shelly, for joining us today. Um, you were both phenomenal. So I uh, appreciate you. Have a, have a nice day, everyone. Awesome. Glad to be here. Take care. Take care.